it comes down to cracking down on what they esteem are fake news because they want to put an end to that kind of thinking so that the only information you get is coming directly from them and nowhere else. Um, so I haven't heard of any major um, situations arising from that, but um, in villages in particular, that is a huge problem. Even just a word of mouth, even if it's at a distance, um, you're bound to get a lot of that coming from there. Um, one of the one of the things that came through loud and clear from our discussion uh, uh, with Jude Moore, who was who who was working with Ellen Johnson Sirleaf um, in Liberia in 25, 2015 rather, uh, this was out of front seat in the in the fight against Ebola, was the the need to rely on traditional leaders, religious leaders to communicate with exactly that kind of population. You know, the people in the urban centers tend to be relatively well connected to sources of news. People in more remote areas, not so much. Um, what sort of structures can Egypt rely on? Well, it's, it is like, as you were saying, um, you know, religious and traditional leaders, well, in this case, it would be more religious leaders in across the country, villages and the big urban centers, Cairo and Alexandria being the, the major examples, except the government, the, the Prime Minister Mustafa Madbouli, he already um, decreed that all mosques and churches be closed. So you're taking that sort of, um, I would say, column of stability or sort of uh, communication from a lot of these communities where despite everything they go through that is sort of their their anchor um, and that's sort of they'll go chances are normally they'll they'll go they'll believe what's coming out of that over what's maybe the government is trying to tell them because it's just been years and years of that sort of mentality um, now without that it's hard to say how they're going to get through um, sort of what, what kind of information is coming at them uh, and um, but I'm assuming that you know with that if the government is sort of trying to be a bit more organized about it they can in fact have those leaders from each sort of community try to communicate with their 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 supporters their followers and try to communicate the information that's needed stay home try to minimize outings, try to minimize contact, that's a sort of uh, constant information. But there hasn't been any formal um, discussion about that right now. Patrick, the, the, um, the ability to communicate, I guess, is, is, is one big role of the, of the state, you know, whether or not they devolve that to, to other actors. Um, other elements of the state are going to get tested as well as we, you know, as we, as we advance week by week into the into the crisis. There, there, there have been people who point to the the perhaps slightly more heavy-handed approach in in Rwanda and and Uganda as perhaps an example of uh, a slightly more military-style command and, and control uh, type type way of operating the state um, and is you know getting results uh, it, it, do you do you buy into that or do you think as um uh namjala nyabola who on, a, on an excellent discussion actually which i recommend to everyone uh there's a a, a hashtag baraza chats and i hope i've got that right um but it but you know uh, uh Oh, sorry, Baraza on Twitter. Um, you know, Nanjala was saying, you know, if you look at China, actually, those months of authoritarian, um, you know, uh, suppression of information, as we were talking about before, was exactly what has led to the explosion. You know, in 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 terms of Rwanda, in terms of Uganda, and then perhaps more broadly, what what elements of of the state are going to be tested, and and uh, which ones are going to work? That's a that's a a pretty broad question, but uh, mm. go run with it. Well, I I think the first target is going to be the provision of public health care. You know, if uh, if this pandemic does hit other African states in the way it's hit South Africa already, and it's hit hit Egypt, uh, and there is. Uh, there, it starts rushing through uh, these societies. Um, the 
public health system is going to be tested like never before. I mean, that was that was always going to be the horror uh, when the Ebola uh, epidemic spread from Liberia and Sierra Leone and landed briefly in in Lagos and um, led by a very effective uh, uh, team at the Nigerian um, Disease Control Center. Um, shut it down. They did the contract tracing. They found that there was one Liberian official, politician actually, who landed and started spreading it. And, and, and they dealt with it very, very quickly. Uh, if they don't do that this time, uh, I think that's, uh, that's going to be the case in places like Nigeria and Kenya, um, Zambia, Zimbabwe, I mean, Co Congo. Uh, and I think the, the concern that you're seeing already is that so many countries, uh, Senegal, uh, Côte d'Ivoire, Côte d'Ivoire has now cut off Abidjan from the, the rest of the country. Uh, Kenya, you have a lockdown, uh, Senegal too. Uh, and, and in fact, several countries are also introducing curfews. So there is a real concern that the, the public health system is just not up to, contain, uh, to dealing with this. So what they're going with first is the, the Chinese approach, which is... Uh, lockdown lockdown and wherever it hits you try to contain it there and, and, and what what the the chinese state system had succeeded in doing despite all the obfuscation the delays and so on was keeping it firstly within wuhan which is a hugely uh, it's a vast city with 11 million people um and keeping it more or less within wuhan and uh, latterly within the Hubei province. Um, I, I, and I guess that that's going to be the target. Now, whether that's at all possible, um, the idea of, uh, of running a ring around Lagos and saying, you, you, you can't get out, uh, you can't go anywhere. Um, it's a bit like trying, when the Buhari government tried to close the borders uh, back, in, back in August. Yes, they, they've They've cut off the big, uh, the big formal trade routes, it's true, land routes into Nigeria, but they haven't cut off all the, uh, the, the, the smuggling and the, the, the illicit cross-border trade. And I guess you'd see the same sort of problem. So I think the, the second uh, area where governments are going to be tested would be the security one. Um, just, you know, if they announce... Uh, increasingly uh, restrictive measures on movement, uh, keeping people in their houses, uh, the compounds and whatever, can they really enforce that? Uh, all all the, the countries across the region now seem to be putting their, their police and their army on alert, they're cancelling leave. Uh, a very grim uh, memo was uh, unearthed by Reuters news agency yesterday showing that the army, um, they've cancelled leave and they should be prepared to force people to go for medical treatment if they, they find out people are testing, uh, uh, are suspected of having the symptoms but not getting tra treatment and so on. And um, also reports of uh, uh, areas being cle cleared for graves and so on. So um, I, th I think the security issue is, is, is going to be a big test. And that's got to be in, in the context of uh, all the other rumbling security problems. The pandemic doesn't seem to have affected the uh, ability of uh, armed insurgent groups in the Sahel and the Horn to continue attacks. And in, even in Southern Africa, you, you, you saw a, a bunch of attacks uh, around uh, Cabo Delgado in the, in the north of Mozambique near the the big LNG uh, export uh, processing plant that's being built. Um, so it, it's, uh, that's, it's going to stretch the security uh, capacity very wide. I think the, the, the point about Uganda and Rwanda is that, yes, they, they're both run by former military leaders. Uh, and Uganda in particular moved very, very quickly uh, on this. So it was both a sort of security reaction to say, oh, we know how to run a strong state here. And anyone who uh, tries to go against our regulations is, is going to get pretty firm treatment. But also uh, a, a, as a kind of um, political move, com 
political communication through vote. You know, I'm Museveni. I've been in power for lo this long because I know how to run a government. And uh, of course, there are elections next year. So it's kind of the dynamics there are quite interesting. So everyone is joined in this public effort to, to fight the virus. So his arch rival, Bobby Wine, then comes up with a great uh, uh, rap number, which he, he does with another musician. Uh, and that goes viral on social media. So he's sort of pushing back with his own talents and not trying to do finger pointing uh, and blaming others, but just saying, yeah, we're all in this together. So they're, they're playing some sort of uh, uh, political game there. And it's, it's going to be interesting to see whether, um, if this, if this crisis intensifies across Africa uh, and the focus becomes on running public health systems, dealing with the security issues and everything, what that's going to do to the opposition movements. Will they just sort of shut up and keep quiet because they don't really have a platform? Or will they use social media to say, yeah, come on, everyone's in this together. We, we, uh, we have a role to play. And it, it, it's a difficult one because what do you do? If, you, if you're critical of a government response, as, as we've heard, there have been a lot of criticism in Nigeria about the government's response and uh, in Kenya too. Uh, what does an opposition do? Do you want to criticize the government and risk being accused of spreading panic and disaffection at a, at a time of national crisis? Or do you say, well, all, you know, all shoulders to the wheel, let's get into this. So I, I, I think the, the, the management of the political crisis coming out of this is still uh, unfolding, but it's going to be a real test of the ingenuity, if you like, of opposition groups and civil society groups, how they position themselves to be constructive, but also make sure that they, uh, they hold governments to account. Why do you think Ghana moved so quickly to approach the IMF? It's, a, it's an election year uh, yeah. in Ghana too. Uh, the IMF is pretty unpopular, I think, in, in, in Ghana. And yet the government very, very quickly uh, you know, accessed this rapidly dispersing uh, mechanism. It, is there something going on in, I mean, obviously in, in recent year, 12 months, 18 months, Ghana's financial system has been under incredible stress. There's been banks which have been rescued, etc. cetera. Um, hmm. Why did they move so quickly? Well, I, I, uh, Ken Aforiata, the Ghana finance minister, actually chaired that meeting we were talking about earlier, uh, called by the uh, UN's Economic Commission for Africa last week. It was a virtual meeting. Um, and uh, he said, we sh what we don't know about the, the medical and the health consequences of the pandemic uh, when it comes to Africa. What we do know immediately is about the economic and financial ones. And we have to move really fast and we have to make our position clear. And I think he probably made an assessment that the IMF is going to be besieged uh, by demands for, for extra funding, uh, for some sort of interim debt, uh, debt relief and, and, and so forth. So I think he wanted to get in at the head of the queue and also perhaps then uh, as leader of that, uh, that meeting last week, his chair of that meeting last week, he wants to, to encourage others to, to go. And, and I think the, the current leadership of the IMF uh, is, um, has been quite supportive. And, and in fact, it went to the G20 to say, look, we are going to have huge demands on our resources. You've got to double uh, our resources to a, to a trillion, uh, to two trillion dollars. Um, the G20 uh, didn't give any direct answer to that. So I think, I, I think um, the Ghana position is, hey, you know, we, we do have uh, big financial problems if, we, uh, if, if this crisis is protracted. And as you say, they're, they're facing uh, an election in December and the government of President Akufo Addo has uh, prided itself uh, on what it says it's, it's economic management. It has got high growth at the moment, uh, which is now, well, so far the last two or three years, it, it, the growth has shot up. But uh, there hasn't been a sense among the wider population of the benefits of, of, of that growth. And now they're facing six months before the election is due to be held, 
uh, some kind of, well, a pretty widespread economic hit. Uh, 